Dear colleagues, good, after good afternoon. My name is Silvia Proietti. I am a urologist uh, in uh, Sarafele Hospital in Milan. It's a great pleasure for me to welcome you to join this webinar organized by the European School of Urology on COVID-19 and the urological management on stone disease. Let me thank the European School of Urology for organize, organizing this webinar and for giving us this great opportunity to share our unfortunate experience during the COVID-19 outbreak. In my opinion, it's very important to share experiences, but also mistakes in order not to replicate them. But let me introduce also my co-panelist, uh, Professor Florian Wagenlena. is uh, a very well-known and esteemed full professor at the University of uh, Justus Liebig University in Gießen in Germany, and is uh, also director of the urological clinic at the same hospital. He is the chair of the, um, the working groups of urological infection at the Germany group, and also of the European Association of Infections in Urology. In this webinar, we will have a two uh, speech, uh, 15 minutes each, and uh, I encourage uh, you to write questions about uh, this speech, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll ask uh, to the presenter uh, and uh, the presenter uh, uh, will answer you. So today, um, uh, Professor Florian will talk about COVID-19 and the hygienic aspects uh, during this pandemic and their implications uh, in uh, urological endoscopic surgery. So please, Florian, we look forward to learning from you. Thank you very much, Silvia, for this very kind and nice introduction. Uh, dear colleagues, it's um, also a very warm welcome from my side uh, for this early evening. And um, my part is to give you some background uh, on COVID-19, on its hygienic aspects and what implications that has, especially in urologic endoscopic surgery. And Silvia later on will follow and focus on the urologic endoscopic surgery part. So these are my disclosures. Now, as you all know, in the end of last year, 2019, in China, a novel virus was uh, discovered um, in the first three patients with an unknown origin. And very soon after the first discovery, and the whole uh, genome sequencing, it was clear that it is a coronavirus, a so-called Sarbeco virus, which is very closely related to other coronaviruses that already also contributed to outbreaks such as the SARS coronavirus or very recently the MERS coronavirus. So it was very closely related, but nevertheless a different virus, which was um, which came true very few, very early in the beginning. Now, as you also all know, now since this uh, December um, in 2019, this novel coronavirus um, started a pandemic, a true pandemic, which has not been seen before in the last uh, century. And uh, this is uh, the recent data from the WHO picture from yesterday. And the size of the bubbles indicates uh, confirmed cases. And uh, nowadays uh, we have uh, three and a half million confirmed cases all over the world. And uh, the sizes of the bubbles uh, represent the different percentages of the confirmed cases in the different areas of the world. And um, you also know that there is a dark rate because not all cases are probably confirmed. And uh, we now have more and more um, studies uh, showing that the dark rate might be as high as 80 times the confirmed cases rate. Um, as you see here, China 
e Asia, but Europe has been one of the second um, uh, largest focuses um, that has been hit by the pandemic, which is now followed by the Americas, especially by North America. Um, that is also shown again here uh, in the timeline of this pandemic as it started with the Western Pacific region, especially with China, and followed by Europe in the February of this uh, year. And then in March, uh, America came in, especially North America, where um, the pandemic is still um, going on in full-blown size. Now, this um, WHO um, pandemic graph illustrates several different, it illustrates several different aspects of the pandemic. Um, on the one hand, we have the sizes of the bubbles, which represent the population of each country. Then on the x-axis, we have cumulative cases uh, affected with coronavirus. And here on the y-axis, we have the cumulative death rate of the case, so the cumulative death. And as you see here, there is some kind of a association between cases and death, but there is very surprisingly some kind an inverse relation with the population of each country. These are the two largest country populations, which is India and China, but they especially have not the highest cumulative case rate and not have the highest cumulative death rate. These smaller bubbles are the European countries. Up here, there is uh, Spain, Italy, United Kingdom, Belgium. Down here, there is uh, other European countries I mean, amongst those um, uh, like uh, Germany. And here is United States of America, which has uh, the most uh, cumulative cases rate and the highest cumulative death rate. So it's very interesting. It's not completely understood why there is uh, so high geographic region differences. Um, this will be certainly something that will be unraveled in the further course of the pandemic. Now, there is also a web um, Euromomo uh, graph and maps uh, site where excess mortality in Europe is constantly um, is constantly calculated. And uh, for example, this graph shows the normal mortality in all the European countries from 2016 up to now. And as you see here, there's always a little bit of an excess mortality in the beginning of each, of each year. For example, 2017, this was contributed to the influenza virus. 2018 was similar in 2019. The outbreak was not as much contributing to the mortality. And now we have an excess mortality, which is, uh, probably, um, which is probably related to the COVID-19 infections. But if you look at the area under these curves, then uh, we will see how in the end of 2020, um, the excess mortality rate is, uh, is uh, uh, coming out uh, in the European countries. And also the excess mortality from this web page is, this is the week 16 uh, excess mortality. You can have these uh, figures for each week. So this is the week 16 in 2020. Is also a bit heterogeneous in the different countries in Europe. Not all countries contribute to the data. Um, but those countries who contribute to the data, there is some differences in excess mortality, which is uh, also interesting to see what are the reasons in the end. Now, coming back to the virus. Now, the coronavirus is an enveloped RNA virus. And this envelope contains high amount of lipids. This is important because this has implications for hand hygiene, has implications for skin disinfection, for instrument disinfection, and for surface disinfection. Um, because you could stratify viruses also in those who are enveloped and those who are non-enveloped. Those viruses who are enveloped have a rather low stability to disinfective agents. Those who are non-enveloped such as noroviruses, for example, 
they have an increase in enhanced stability to this infection. Now, as I've said, the coronavirus is an enveloped RNA virus. It contains high amount of lipids and therefore alcohol and lipid solvents, they're all effective in killing the virus. And um, there are also good studies, um, at least for the SARS coronavirus, which kind of uh, sterilizing agents are efficacious. And as you see here, sterilin, microbac, corsolin, all these normally used um, disinfective agents are all um, effective for uh, hand drop, for surface disinfection, and also for instrument disinfection. And um, as the novel coronavirus is it's, uh, from its um, surface envelope um, constituents, similar to the uh, SARS coronavirus, it, um, it, I think it can be extrapolated um, that uh, all disinfectants that have been tested in the SARS coronavirus are also effective in um, the novel coronavirus. So therefore, if we summarize this um, parameter that the implications um, for hand hygiene, disinfection, instrument disinfection, surface is disinfection can be regarded as disinfection as usual. Now going to pathophysiology. The, SARS uh, the, the novel coronavirus um, docks to certain receptors, uh, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor 2. And uh, in contrast to uh, the SARS coronavirus, it also docks uh, and replicates in the upper respiratory tract, but uh, the um, disease is driven by, um, the, cor by the coronavirus and uh, the attachment in the lower respiratory tract and in the lungs. And then we have three different kinds of clinical scenarios. We have asymptomatic infection, we have mild infected individuals, and we have severe infected individuals. So the asymptomatic and the mild infected um, uh, individuals, they probably have a different immunological scenario compared to those of, that are infected with a severe infection in the lower, in the lower um, respiratory tract and probably effective T cell and macrophages um, uh, to play a, a pivotal role in containing the infection in the, in the lower airways. Um, and those who are heavily infected, severe infected, um, they, uh, mood, they uh, uh, develop um, a, a acute respiratory distress syndrome, but they also develop viral sepsis, where multi-organ failure is um, uh, the primary outcome in, in those patients severely affected. Now there's a recent publication um, that has been uh, published last week in the, the New England Journal, which uh, looked in depth on the outcome and on the uh, clinical parameters of 1,099 patients that have been initially um, um, uh, seen in China. And in this publication, the median age was 47 years, but only 43% of patients had fever on admission during the hospital stay, almost 90% of patients um, showed fever, but that demonstrates that fever is not a primary hallmark, at least in the beginning of this disease. 67% of patients had cough, 23% had coexisting illness, 15% had already severe illness on admission, but 86% had an abnormal lung CT scan, which is apparently a very sensitive parameter, even in those patients that did not have fever initially. Also lymphocytopenia was frequently seen in the patients in 83%. And that seems that lymphocytes do play a pivotal role also in the course of the disease. 5% of these thousand patients were admitted to intensive care. 2.3% needed invasive mechanical ventilation, and the overall death rate in these uh, 1,000 patients was 1.4%. Another very important study looked into virological assessment in 10 patients. They looked into swabs of the um, nasopharynx in sputum, stool, serum, and urine, and this uh, figure shows how over the course um, of days, 
the viral load decreased in the, in the throat swabs, in the nasopharyngeal swab, as well as in sputum and stool. There was no indication that viral um, uh, copies were seen in urine. And then another important scenario is how, in over the time course, how the seroconversion of patients uh, developed. And as you see here, after 10 to 12 days, almost all the patients seroconverted positively. And those patients who seroconverted positively did have a negative viral culture. So these are certainly very important uh, clinical parameters which are needed uh, in order to assess the patients and to, in order to assess the viral spread. Apparently up to now, urine is not uh, infectious. So there's always, at least politically, a discussion, do face masks, masks prevent viral shedding? There's also a recent study, an interventional study, that looked into patients that have been infected with coronavirus. Other patients that have been for control that have been infected with influenza virus and others that have been infected with renovirus. And um, this interventional study uh, separated patients that did not have a mask from those patients that did have a mask. And very interestingly, patients infected with coronavirus and that had a mask did not um, uh, that did not uh, um, uh, did have a mask did not spread uh, droplet particles infected with coronavirus or aerosols that are uh, smaller particles. So apparently, especially in corona in coronavirus infected patients, face masks are apparently very uh, preventive. Also, in the influ influenza virus patients, uh, the the masks uh, were able to. Uh, prevent virus shedding, not in all the patients, especially in those who had uh, 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 smaller particles released, uh, the masks were not as efficacious, and the rhinovirus infected patients, in those patients, the masks were not preventive uh, at all. And um, the last um, thing is about healthcare protection, um, personal protective equipment. There is a Cochrane database, a very recent Cochrane database uh, um, report that um, not only on coronavirus, but also on other viruses, that personal protective equipment certainly is preventive. Uh, there are several types of PPE, and the more the body is covered, the better is the, uh, the objective protection. However, this has to be balanced with the problems by um, putting on the PPE or by doffing the uh, PPE. So therefore, there needs to be some kind of uh, balance um, because the more breathable types of PPE may lead to similar levels of contamination and may be more comfortable. So this will be taken up by Sylvia. Um, the EOU guidelines office have uh, put in place a rapid reaction group and this is just uh, for a urological intervention. And this is the table uh, for, uh, for the urodesthiasis guidelines panels. Uh, what patients uh, have a high priority, have emergency priority, have intermediate priority, and have low priority. And as you, as you see for diagnosis, most patients that undergo uh, urolithiasis interventions uh, uh, in the diagnosis of high uh, uh, and even emergency priority and for treatment the same most patients that um, uh, need um, stone treatment are in the intermediate high or even emergency priority group. So if I summarize um, this um, talk um, I will give you some take-home messages. So COVID-19 pandemic is uh, still going on. There are large regional different uh, data we have seen, different uh, scenarios, different courses. With regards to the virus itself, it's an envelope virus that makes it susceptible to usual disinfectants for hand hygiene, as well as uh, surface disinfection, as well as instrument disinfection. The infectious virus is mainly in the airway samples. Uh, there is no clear indication that uh, urine might be infectious. For healthcare protection, face masks um, decrease shedding. There is uh, data from an interventional study 
personal protective equipment is effective. Um, you can have maximal protection, but there needs to be some balance um, for um, contamination by donning and doffing of the um, personal protective equipment. And uh, when we go to urethias, this um, uh, interventions, usually they are higher intermediate priority. Um, uh, and therefore, most of these patients need anyhow um, workup and treatment um, for their urethiasis, which will be, uh, um, uh, Sylvia will be go in, in more depth. So I think this was my part of the presentations. I will uh, hand over to Sylvia for questions. So Florian, thank you so much for this very interesting lecture, very exhaustive lecture. So we have uh, so many questions uh, in uh, the website. I have to choose them. Uh, but uh, first of all, uh, we have uh, one question about uh, which, pre uh, which uh, uh, indication do you have uh, while a surgeon uh, uh, operates a patient during the pandemic. In particular, I would like to ask you for endourologists. Well, uh, as I showed you the tables um, that have been put together by the guidelines group in uh, endoscopic stone surgery, um, usually most patients should have diagnosis and should have treatment. Um, and the, the, the question is now how, and that is also different from different scenarios in the different regions and the hospitals, how can you, um, how can you make sure that the patient does not have uh, asymptomatic uh, viral shedding and how can you make sure that there's no cross infection or cross contamination of coronavirus in the hospital. And there are different strategies, one of the, uh, most adopted strategy is to at least ensure that there is a so-called COVID um, cold or COVID hot site. So that means if, that you uh, that the hospitals separate uh, separate uh, um, areas where they make the best effort not to have COVID uh, positive patients, uh, and that would be certainly fall true also for patients that. Uh, are operated uh, in endurological surgery that you that the, the the hospital should take care um, and to put in place strategies um, there are different strategies how to select for those patients but put in place strategies where to select and uh, where to select patients that are possibly infected with covid virus and then if this is ruled out these patients can go for uh, uh, for endoscopic surgery if there are emergency patients i would strongly suggest that uh, uh, the patients go into uh, into surgery and the normal normal hygienic precautions are, are, are kept. Perfect, thank you so much. Just to be pra pragmatic with our friends, uh, uh, do you wear, uh, when you perform in this pandemic, uh, just a surgical mask or N N95 mask or both, for example? No, uh, in in our in our uh, region we have a low prevalence. I only use normal surgical mask. If there is a positively tested patient, I would certainly use uh, the uh, the uh, PPE mask. But uh, otherwise, I only use normal surgical masks. Perfect. Do you use Google's? Uh, no. Not uh, in, in a non-tested patient, I would not use Googles. Okay. So which kind of anesthesia do you prefer during this pandemic, for example, for a JJ stand placement? Uh, anesthesia? Was that the question? Yeah, anesthesia. 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 Um, we wouldn't do, uh, we would not uh, uh, change the normal anesthesia that is uh, normally performed uh, in a double J stand uh, insertion. For example, let's say the patient has an obstructive stone, we would still use general anesthesia as normal. So, of course, there is a risk for the anesthetist, but there are um, there are separate uh, instructions how anesthetists can uh, safely intubate the patients, um, but usually we would not use different anesthetic um, uh, scenarios. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. I have another question. So, you know, we have a patient with stone and 
uh, we can have sepsis in our stone patient and uh, we have a patient in the emergency department you have to operate this patient uh, with fever and stone as well but uh, how uh, you are sure that this patient uh, has not the COVID-19 as well? Well, we, you can never be sure. This is uh, indeed, these are tricky situations, uh, but the experiences we had is that if you would, uh, for example, uh, wait until these patients have a negative, uh, a negative swab, would certainly put them in a risk scenario to uh, to die of urosepsis, for example. And therefore, uh, in these patients, if they are uroseptic, they have, an, for example, an obstructive uh, stone and need a, a double J stand. We certainly would do the best uh, hygienic precautions and go uh, and go forward for uh, uh, um, decompression of the kidney, and not uh, delay this procedure by um, additional uh, COVID-19 um, uh, um, detection or, or samplings. Perfect, thank you so much. Now, one suggestion from you for the future. So do you think it's important serological test uh, in the future? Yes, definitely. Uh, if serological tests uh, would be more available in the future, I think this is an important uh, contribution to our armamentarium because um, there are certain, uh, still certain uh, discussions about the serological tests, but uh, I think it will be a very important uh, armamentarium to stratify those patients who have either uh, been, uh, who have either um, uh, um, had COVID-19 and overcome COVID-19 or those who have for some reason an immunity for those. And therefore, uh, I think if we have the serology readily available for, uh, for more uh, patients, that will be certainly uh, help and improve and facilitate our current, uh, our, our current management in these patients. Thank you so much again. So do you think it's important to check every healthcare worker in uh, in the hospital for coronavirus uh, of course every healthcare worker i would not think so because um, there there is also always you have to balance what is uh, what can you deliver and what is uh, feasible to do and um, you probably would overstress the current capacity of screening if you test every healthcare worker. Uh, it would be also a better strategy to test those who have, for example, had um, uh, a close uh, contact with a COVID positive patient, or for example, if you would have this capacity uh, to test those who might have a risk, um, but not certainly to test all the healthcare workers. I think this would overload the test capacity systems. Thank you. So I, I have another interesting question. What do you think about patients with the immunodeficiency? Yeah, there are certain risk patients, and this is not clear. clear. There are uh, those patients who have additional um, comorbidities, of course, patients that are undergoing uh, uh, chemotherapy, for example, this is, uh, these are true uh, uh, risk patients and we currently do not have a very good guidance how to, uh, how to manage these patients. Of course, because currently we don't have, uh, uh, other than infection control and isolation strategy, these are certainly patients where these hygienic um, measurements should be maximum. Um, and therefore, you need to do, for example, chemotherapy in a patient that has metastasized disease. There is no debate about that. Um, and uh, in, in those uh, scenarios, I would, uh, um, I would um, advise to maximize uh, in infection control practices, but uh, con continue to, to do uh, chemotherapy, for example. Perfect, thank you so much. So you cannot imagine how many questions we have. I have to choose them. But anyway, I have another question for you. Do you consider important to increase or to, uh, to, to offer to your patients your uh, anticoagulant 
anticoagulant prophylaxis uh, in COVID-19 pandemic? Uh, uh, anticoagulation anticoagulation. as usual, yes. Why, why should it not but be? Prof um, prophylaxis. Yes, uh, we, we have not changed our, our regimens in that regard. So we, we do the same as always. Okay, maybe because there are some uh, publications that there is uh, an uh, hypercoagulability during COVID-19, yeah, yeah. COVID but yeah, yeah. Uh, you don't change uh, any protocol in your patients. Yeah, yeah, okay. there, are, there, are, um, there are currently many um, uh, discussions uh, also about uh, uh, RTE inhibitors and so on and so forth, but um, we would not uh, choose currently our regimens because all the clinical studies currently or the clinical epidemiological studies have not really shown a benefit if you if you would uh, if you would change the regimen especially also not changing RCE uh, inhibitors um, because uh, current uh, clinical um, insights do not suggest to to change the regimens so Florian you already talked about the the virus in the urine what do you think about uh, the presence because uh, you know we have we have some publication that uh, they didn't found the virus in the urine but there are some some others that maybe the virus is present in the urine why so many differences i think one has to differentiate um between on the one hand uh, molecularly positive, uh, molecularly positive uh, signs in the urine, and uh, true uh, positive cultures. So we know from PCR that PCR can uh, amplify also dead viral particles. So this is uh, one of the first uh, differentiations. And uh, up to now, uh, I have not seen convincing re reports that the urine is infectious. Um, in those studies that I have seen, most of the studies uh, either have not at all seen uh, infectious particles. Some of them have seen positive PCRs, but not uh, positive uh, cultural viruses. And therefore, up to now, I think um, the urine has not clearly demonstrated to be infectious. Uh, this is in contrast, of course, to, uh, to, to airway samples as well as stool samples. With stool samples, it's not yet clear if this is um, infectious viruses, but with the urine, I'm, I'm quite confident that uh, the urine up to now from the studies I have seen is non-infectious. At least we do not see in our hospital the urine as an infectious agent. Thank you so much. Maybe the last question because we have to move on. So do you, um, do you have any specific consent for your patients during this pandemic when you operated them? You mean informed consent to, yeah. to, to, to let them yeah. sign? No. Maybe um, maybe the question is about uh, if you have a, a specific consent that maybe the patient can uh, get infected in the hospital uh, because you know we don't know about the asymptomatic patients. Uh. Yeah, no, uh, I think of course uh, Corona is uh, some uh, some specific situation we currently have, but we also have to think back. I showed you the excess mortality rates uh, in the years where we had uh, influenza virus outbreaks, and nobody talked about those things when we had these influenza virus outbreaks. Nobody would have come to the idea to let the patient sign an informed consent. And uh, at least we don't do that in the hospital because if you would start that, uh, you, they would also need uh, to, uh, to sign informed consent for potentially uh, cross infections by MRSA and get infected with those kinds. So at least we don't do it. And I don't think uh, that it is uh, something that, uh, that um, makes sense to my uh, opinion because then we would have to overthink uh, all our uh, uh, legal um, in legal issues we we do in in outbreaks which we have every year with influenza or other viruses. Thank you so much, Florian. And we have more questions, but we have to move to move on. So, thank you very much. So it's now a great pleasure uh, to introduce 
Professor Silvia Proietti, uh, as she has introduced herself already. She is working in the urology department on San Rafael Hospital in uh, Milan, and she's principally performing nowadays endourological treatment of stones and upper urinary tract tumors. Um, she's also vice director of the European Training Center of Endourology, and uh, she's today talking about the urological management of stone disease in the current COVID-19 era. Silvia, I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Florian. So let's talk now about the urological management of stone disease during the COVID-19 outbreak. But uh, before starting, uh, I would like to uh, I would like to thank my uh, mentor, Dr. Giusti, and my chief, uh, Professor Gaboardi, who were co-author with me in this publication published in the European Urology Journal. And let me thank also the ETC team, uh, starting from uh, our international fellow, Dr. Basulto from Mexico, Dr. Yao from Singapore, and our Italian assistant, Dr. Said and Dr. Rapallo, who contribute to making this editorial possible. So um, last February, when uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, this virus caught us by surprise. In the very beginning, in Italy, the problem was absolutely underestimated. And we were unprepared to fight against the virus. Just to give you an example, last February, when the schools, uh, the school, schools uh, closed, uh, people took this moment uh, for uh, holidays and a lot of people were went to the mountains for example and the virus at that time uh, was circulating massively that's the reason why our health system was completely overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients and uh, we were not able to uh, answer to uh, routine patient needs. And uh, in our hospital, surgical departments uh, have been asked to minimize uh, or uh, totally suspend the elective operation to address the overwhelming increase in COVID-19 patient care needs. If you look at this graph of Professor uh, Rocco, you can see that the, in the very beginning, the number of uh, uh, coronavirus uh, cases uh, increased a lot and the uh, surgical activities decreased uh, until uh, to be suspended. And uh, this strategy to uh, de um, of de-escalation of the surgical activity that uh, depends on the emergency, emergency status of the individual healthcare system uh, aim to free up inpatient beds, healthcare staff, PPE and operating rooms that you, during the pandemic became uh, ICU beds and also this strategy aimed to lower the need for ICU postoperative care of critical patients during elective surgery. So in the very beginning, as I told you, in Italy, uh, in our hospital, we were unprepared to fight against the virus. And there were continuous changes of directions, protocols, instructions, depending on what we were faced to. But of course, this created a lot of confusion and anxiety among the personnel. And day by day, we navigate by sight. In our department, we create this flowchart for, uh, for the admission of our patients. So we uh, carefully uh, review the waiting list and we identify the patient uh, with a, a lower risk to develop uh, complications uh, in case of surgical postponement. And we call personally the patients in order to um, inform them that it was a medical decision and not an administrative one based on the medical history and the uh, ongoing emergencies. So we call the patient the day before uh, of the surgery and uh, we ask about their health status and also uh, about any epidemiological link. In, in particular, in the very beginning, there were odd zones in Italy, in particular in Lombardy. Uh, and we asked 
about this um, uh, this information and the same day of uh, uh, the same day of the uh, world admission, we screen all the patients by using thermal scanner. And in case of fever and in surgical and in case also of surgical emergency, we send the patient in case of suspe uh, suspected COVID-19 to a, a dedicated OR and ward for this subset of patients. And these are for COVID-19 patients as a negative pressure environment and the um, anesthetic machine is used just for these patients. And also the entrance uh, to this OR is completely different from the entrance of the other operating rooms. And uh, also in case of fever, but not uh, in case of surgical emergency, we uh, advise uh, patient, the patients to uh, to go to, to the emergency department uh, to call the GP or to stay at, at home uh, depending on the severity of the symptoms. So in case of no fever, we ask again about the new onset of respiratory tract symptoms in the previous 14 days in the very beginning, but now we are asking also about gastrointestinal problems, for example, and again about any epidemiological link. And based on this criteria, we, have, we decide whether or not to admit the patient to our OR. So when uh, we published this paper, uh, um, I received some criticism by some colleagues, uh, and they asked me why we were not, uh, we didn't check uh, the uh, our patients uh, with at least two swabs uh, negative before the world admission. But as I, as I told you, we were absolutely unprepared. Uh, to fight against the virus uh, and our testing capability and uh, especially in the very beginning it was not enough to check uh, every patient so we found the balance uh, to carry on uh, with uh, the operations uh, and also to uh, to try to um, uh, to protect the patients and the healthcare workers as well uh, so we were lucky enough to operate our patients until the end of, the, of March because uh, our, um, our department is uh, in a detachment of the main hospital where the emergency department is. But at the end of, the, of March, uh, our operating rooms were closed for two weeks. But now we are seeing the light the light at the end of the tunnel and we are operating our patient in another hospital hoping, uh, hoping uh, COVID-19 free and the new protocol is to check every patient with a chest CT scan and one coronavirus swab uh, negative before the ward admission. So it is important also in our department to uh, to act on individuals, uh, on patients, as I told you, and on healthcare workers. Uh, uh, Florian uh, has already explained the importance uh, to wear proper PPI. But what is important is also to act on the activities. Uh, as training centers, uh, center, we uh, stop all the training activities. Uh, and my mentor, Dr. Giusti, asked uh, our uh, international fellow to stay at home uh, for safety. We stop all the elective outpatient clinics, uh, and we start with uh, telemedicine. Also, the, um, the access to the OR should be strictly limited to the surgeons, anesthesiology, and anesthesiologists and nurse team. But focusing on the uh, stone disease, uh, as I told you, every hospital suggests to delay elective surgery. And in theory, the benign pathology should be, should be the first to be postponed. But we know very well that stone, uh, stone disease represents a benign condition, but it can lead in non-negligible number of cases of severe infective complications that could increase the burden of emergency services already overwhelmed with the COVID-19 patients. So we try to create a scheme uh, for our stone patients patients and uh, uh, we identify the patients, as I told you, with a higher risk to develop uh, surgical complications. And we create a scheme of prioritization 
And uh, of course, uh, to identify patients uh, with high, higher risk compared to, for example, a patient with non-obstructing ranastone with normal kidney function, no solid, uh, with the bilateral functional kidney, no symptoms, no UTIs. But when, when we create this scheme, uh, our concern was uh, where to place patients uh, with already in place uh, urethral stent on nephrostom before the COVID-19 pandemic. So we decided to move up in the, in the list uh, this, this subset of patients uh, depending on the stent in the welling time, urinary infections uh, and also symptoms. So we prefer during this pandemic uh, to, uh, whenever possible, to perform uh, outpatient surgical procedure, to place uh, urethral stent uh, with strings uh, in order, uh, of course, whenever, whenever possible uh, after an uneventful uh, procedure, in order to avoid uh, any outpatient clinics uh, uh, for stent removal. And in case, as suggest, suggested uh, by the European guidelines, uh, in case of urethral stent on nephrostomy, uh, we have to decompress the system and uh, whenever possible, we have to perform this under local anesthesia, sparing a ventilator. But of course, it, it depends on the emergency status of our hospital. Even though uh, the, uh, the evidence is not so robust uh, for uh, the antibiotic prophylaxis, maybe Florian can help me in understanding this, uh, we uh, give them, uh, we give the, uh, antibiotic prophylaxis in patients with the urethral stent and UTIs in order to avoid uh, any severe infective complication in these patients. So we already talked about the presence of the virus in the urine. Anyway, provided the, that the uh, cleaning process of our reusable armamentarium is well performed, the sterilization, sterilization should be safe. But anyway, uh, in order to avoid any risk of cross-contamination uh, whenever possible, and uh, if it is av available in uh, your OR, you can use single-use scopes. Even though I'm not a big fan of SWL, but anyway, during this pandemic, maybe the SWL could be useful for uh, urologists because it allows uh, social distancing, outpatient procedure, and to treat patients. Otherwise, uh, they have to wait uh, uh, the, uh, the waiting list for the um, uh, surgical procedure. So what about the renal colic? So we have to do our best to manage these patients at home or in outpatient clinics in order to avoid any admission in to an overwhelmed emergency department, maybe by using, for example, telemedicine, why not? In the very beginning, we had uh, um, some rumors that uh, the non-steroidal uh, non -steroidal anti inflammatory drugs uh, uh, were linked to the worsening of COVID-19, but to be honest, there is no speci uh, specific evidence uh, for these uh, drugs and the COVID-19. Of course, there is a reasonable evidence that these drugs uh, can uh, worsen the, um, uh, the course of respiratory and cardiovascular adverse effects in several settings. But if you look at the European Medical Agency website, there is no recommendation against the use of these drugs. And as written in this very nice editorial by Dr. Pradel, um, just to be pragmatic, uh, uh, if you have any suspicious uh, COVID-19 patient, uh, try to avoid this, uh, these drugs in uh, a patient with renal colics and follow the same rules that we follow during pregnancy. So we have to keep in mind anyway that some of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are available over the counter and is very important during this pandemic. Just a few words about telemedicine. We, it is very useful and safe during this pandemic for our stone patients because it allows us to keep patients at home and to reduce the virus dissemination. But we have just started in our hospital with a, telemedicine, we have to promote 
the uh, telemedicine with our patients uh, and it has been demonstrated also in this uh, um, in this paper by dr luciani that uh, um, has a greater benefit over cancellation especially especially in patients with high risk of urological malignancies and also stone patients with the potential complications. So, as I told you, we have to promote telemedicine with our stone patients and we have uh, to tell them that uh, uh, it is safer than face-to-face -face consultation because the only infection that uh, um, one can catch by using telemedicine as a computer virus. But anyway, apart joking, uh, I'm sure that is, uh, it will be uh, fully integrated in our clinical practice uh, also when the pandemic is over. So what do we have to expect in the post-COVID-19 era? So we have to expect, in our opinion, uh, more difficult and challenging cases uh, of patients uh, whose procedure have been postponed and uh, many patients who were almost uh, on the top of the waiting list uh, will be disappointed by the fact that we will have uh, to operate uh, first a more urgent patient schedule during the lockdown period. Uh, maybe our summer will be a, a working summer instead of summer vacation. And instead, while we are, we will operate our patients, stone patients, we will see uh, in uh, our skin, uh, screen instead of uh, uh, stone, we will see our below uh, beaches. Uh, um, so in conclusion, uh, inspired by the Roman aphorism, civis pacem parabellum, if you want peace, prepare for war, and the urologists, the urologists, doctors have to be prepared to fight the COVID-19 pandemic to return to long-lasting normality as soon as possible, we, we hope, in a COVID-19 world free. Thank you so much for your attention. Yes, Silvia, thank you very much for this, uh, for this uh, presentation, also for summarizing and balancing uh, how to uh, best um, navigate uh, and not to forget patients who really need uh, urological uh, treatment. So um, the first uh, question I have is, what about late complications of the virus? For example, are the inflammatory pulmonary changes reversible? And there's a second one in this question. Uh, can this virus cause orchitis? As one British study shows, the virus in testicular biopsies. So, thank you so much for your question, Florian. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, I'm not a pneumologist, but anyway, you know that uh, uh, there are some pub publications that uh, maybe the pulmonary uh, complication that we have with COVID-19 uh, maybe can lead to fibrosis. So we have to wait uh, if uh, this fibrosis uh, will be rever reversible or not. Uh, but to be honest, it's not my issue, so I cannot answer more, uh, pre uh, more precisely. So what about uh, orchitis? Uh, uh, I know that there are some, uh, um, uh, there is a, this publication that they found the, uh, the virus in the, uh, in the testis biopsies, uh, but to be honest, I, I, I don't know how to answer you if there is any uh, implication in the fertility and uh, also in uh, in the future for these males yeah uh, indeed i agree it's too early to say about uh, long-term complications so second question what is your thoughts on doing uh, pcnl during covid 19 is it safe or is it better to do flexible retrograde uh, ureteroronoscopy so to be honest in my opinion uh, there is no difference uh, uh, between a flexible ureteroscopy and pcnl of course you have to be expert in performing pcnl uh, because because otherwise we know that the uh, the complication could be very severe um, if you are not an expert in pcnl but uh, 
in my opinion, uh, from uh, an effective point of view, uh, with the flexible uh, ureteroscopy, you can have a very high pressure during the, uh, this procedure, and it can lead to uh, infected complications, uh, and uh, in some cases also, uh, they require ICU. So we have to keep in mind uh, uh, always uh, the, um, the status, the emergency status of our hospital and uh, how, um, how much is safe to perform flexible ureteroscopy because we have to keep in mind that the ventilators during the COVID-19 should be, uh, pandemic should be available for this subset of patients. Um, so we have to, to do our best uh, to uh, avoid any admission uh, in ICU in our stone patients. Uh, so maybe sometimes uh, if, you, uh, are, um, if you are able to perform PCNL, uh, PCNL could be uh, quicker than flexible ureteroscopy and also the, uh, the intrarenal pressure is uh, uh, lower than flexible ureteroscopy and so you have to balance uh, anyway I, I cannot suggest to perform a very long flexible ureteroscopy instead of uh, performing for example mini pcnl or pcnl because uh, if you are quicker maybe the chance uh, the possibility to develop a, a very severe infection is low. Great, thank you. Another question, maybe I misinterpreted it, but did you say that all patients undergo a thoracic CT before admission? That was in your algorithm. Yeah, uh, in this new hospital where we are operating, uh, um, it is mandatory to perform to our patient just CT scan and one uh, um, and to have one negative swab uh, in every patient before award admission. Uh, I don't know if uh, um, um, if it is uh, better or not to have uh, just CT scan, but it has been demonstrated that in, in uh, one publication by a, radio a Chinese uh, um, a radiological group uh, that chest CT scan, the sensitivity for COVID-19 um, uh, is very high, is around 90%. So if we consider the chest CT scan plus the, uh, the swab, that the sensitivity is around 60-70%, we can have a lower risk uh, to admit patient, asymptomatic patient in our ward. Um, how urgent would you consider a patient with an encrusted or incarcerated ureteral double J step? So uh, we know that uh, um, in, um, uh, calcified stent is a very challenging uh, uh, procedure for endourologists uh, also in uh, non COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, um, uh, if it is not um, um, so we have to balance always the situation. If we have, uh, of course, uh, UTIs and we have to operate, uh, recurrent to UTIs, we have to operate these patients. In my opinion, it's better to, uh, to perform a combined approach uh, from below with flexi or semi-rigid ureteroscope and from above uh, with the PCNL in order to do our best uh, to remove uh, the, the stent in, at, and it is safe in my opinion, to remove a, calci a very calcified stent from above uh, through the uh, PCNL access in order to avoid uh, any other complications, uh, of course, uh, non-COVID-19 related in this subset of patients. Uh, another question that fits to the previous one, do you test uh, PCR to all patients who undergo endurologic surgery? Uh, as um, PCR, do you mean uh, the uh, the test for the coronavirus? Or right. The, yes. The, yeah. No. No. The, the coronavirus test. Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, as I told you, yes, uh, we check every patient before the ward admission uh, with the PCR test for coronavirus, and we should be, of course, uh, negative. And also the asymptomatic ones, because this was another question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Every patient. Every patient. Otherwise, uh, we cannot admit them. So, um, is it fair to say the spinal anesthesia is safer for treating ureteral stones or JJ in stand insertion? Or how do you, how do you, uh, um, what's your preferred anesthesia in these, um, in these uh, patients? 
So, Florian, uh, maybe you don't know me, but uh, I perform, we perform uh, uh, whenever possible if there is not uh, any contraindication for patients, uh, uh, flexible uteroscopy, and for, of course, uh, PCNL in general anesthesia. Uh, because uh, uh, we can perform uh, in our hands, of course, uh, um, a better job for our patient. But anyway, um, in this pandemic, uh, I know that uh, for anesthesiologists, the intubation uh, time is the um, higher risk, uh, highest risk uh, for the anesthesiologists for the virus uh, aerosolization. So we have to find the balance uh, uh, with them and maybe the spinal anesthesia, even though I'm not a big fan, uh, could be reasonable in this pandemic uh, in order to avoid the intubation also for uh, our anesthesiolo uh, anesthesiologist. But anyway, if you want to perform an outpatient procedure and to, um, um, to discharge patient, uh, for example, in the afternoon, and you perform a spinal anesthesia, you have to, uh, to uh, be sure that the patient is able, able uh, to, um, to pass urine in order not to send uh, them at home without uh, to be, uh, being sure, uh, sure of this. Yeah, maybe a last question because we are already reaching our time limits. Um, if the patient comes for a UTI or a suspected pyelonephritis, uh, then how to differentiate whether he can have a COVID infection or maybe this is due to the urinary tract infection? This is, of course, a, a dilemma, uh, but we have to keep in mind that, um, uh, that we also treat patients with urosepsis right and not to delay treatment. So what is your strategy in those patients? So it's a very challenging case. Uh, uh, so we have to treat a patient with an infected stone and we have, if we have any suspicious, uh, according to the uh, epidemiological questions that uh, we ask uh, to our patients, uh, we have to, um, uh, to consider this patient as uh, uh, a suspicious COVID-19, but it is um, difficult to differ differ uh, differentiate uh, this. But of course, also the lab test could be useful uh, in case of uh, uh, bacterial infection. Uh, some, uh, we, and sometimes we have also uh, procalcitonin that uh, is uh, high higher than uh, in uh, viral uh, infection, so we can. Uh, we can use also this test uh, uh, helpful for us uh, for uh, uh, making differences uh, in this uh, in this patient. Yeah, I think we have to stop here. There are many more questions. Uh, not all probably we will be able to address in this limited time. So Sylvia, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Also for thank you, uh, Florian. Thank it was you. a pleasure um, and also for sharing your personal experiences and I think we all are in very special times and uh, we have already now learned a bit how to cope with this pandemic. Uh, as Sylvia said in the beginning we were really overwhelmed but we have now prepared, we are prepared. The evidence in, in many aspects uh, is now improving and we are it's still everything is dynamic and it's flexible, but we are preparing more and better algorithms uh, to cope with these patients. And I hope you had a, a nice afternoon, a nice early evening uh, with this webinar, which was uh, initiated by the European School of Urology. And thank you very much again. And I wish you a safe further time and a nice evening. Thank, thank you, you to all of you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe.